Welcome to The Journey Home. My name is Marcus Grodi, your host for this weekly live program in which I have the great privilege to introduce to you men and women who, because of their love for Jesus Christ, are committed also to the church that he established in his apostles. And this is Open Line First Monday, when you have uh, even more opportunity to phone in your questions or emails to the guests. Uh, your calls are an important part of this program, particularly. My guest this evening is Dr. Richard Cross. It's the second time that he's joined me on the journey home. He's a good friend. He is a doctor in psychology, taught psychology at Francis University, as well as another, at least one other university and uh, now is an educational researcher and consultant. Uh, Rick is a lifelong Catholic, but we'll talk a bit about his own journey of faith. But mostly we're going to, uh, uh, on this open line for Friday, address a variety of issues. Of course, it's open line, so whatever you'd like to pose for Rick. But particularly the questions of psychology in relationship to education or faith, formation of faith, and maybe what's happening in our culture today. Remember, your calls are an important part of the program. So give us a call at 1-800-221-9460, or you can send us an email at journeyhome, one word, at ewtn.com. Swift, welcome back to the Journey Home. Great to be here. As I've often said to some of my guests, I have to use this excuse for the program to get together with old friends. It's been a few years. Yeah. But you moved out to one of my favorite states of the union. That's right, Massachusetts. Massachusetts land. Right. I thought I'd actually spend my rest of my life up there as a pastor. Mm -hmm. cause I, that's where I went to seminary. It's in a good part of the world. Right. Good lobsters and shrimp. That's right. Right. Well, let's begin as I jump right into it. I know we're already going to have some phone calls and emails that are coming in. I'd like to begin with you give them a five minute or so summary of your spiritual journey. Well, um, as you mentioned in your introduction, I was uh, born and raised a Catholic, uh, cradle Catholic, grew up in uh, uh, East Denver, Park Hill District, and both of my parents were uh, born and raised Catholics and uh, uh, went to parochial schools, had the good Loretta nuns at that time, uh, gave me a fairly decent education in catechisms and things of that nature. I have to say, as a as a child, I only knew about uh, uh, the spiritual life and to the example of my mother and father, uh, particularly my mother. Uh, my father was out a lot working, but uh, she was a great example, a daily rosary, uh, reading lots of scriptures. And there was a time in, in oh, I would say maybe uh, uh, late grade school, early high school, uh, right around the Vatican Council time, my mom uh, was somewhat affected by her asthma and had to spend a lot of time in bed, but every time I walked into the room, she would always be reading the documents of Vatican II and uh, saying her rosary and these kinds of things, and I always had a good humor about it, even though her health wasn't well for, for a number of years there when I was a kid. But uh, went on to uh, high school, again, uh, Catholic high school at the time, the Jesuits, when there were a lot of changes going on, saw a lot of, uh, a lot of craziness uh, at, at the... Uh, at the high school there, and uh, but uh, kept my faith largely through a good example from uh, a few of my friends, but uh, most of my parents and some of my friends' parents, and uh, went on to uh, college again, Catholic college, Thomas Aquinas, great school, fantastic education, a solid tradition, and met some uh, profoundly spiritual and intellectual people uh, at that school that uh, had a deep, deep influence on me, particularly uh, uh, the founder of the school, Dr. MacArthur, and. Uh, uh, many of his colleagues who uh, founded the school, uh, and uh, through that whole that whole period in in my uh, spiritual journey, so to speak, uh, I always had a sense, sometimes stronger than others, uh, a lot of little downhills, a few uphills uh, in the spiritual journey. Uh, to um, always had a sense of the importance of of, uh, of the Eucharist and, and, a, and a, a personal prayer life, and and particularly trying to get to, our, to know our Lord personally. In that regard, uh, uh, sometime late high school, early college, I began to read uh, St. Teresa of Avila, uh, particularly in her autobiography, and where there's wonderful, wonderful images of her personal relationship with our Lord. And that had a profound influence on me, and I think inspired me to, uh, or encouraged me rather, to, uh, to uh, develop that in, in prayer life. And uh, um, now, very happily married. Uh, about 19 years now, and uh, five children, with a lovely uh, wife, again, a cradle Catholic, and uh, 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 just uh, very, very happy for all the great opportunities that my family gave me, the great example, 
and be grateful to the church and many of the good priests and nuns that helped me, the nuns that taught and put up with me. <laughs> I was not a very good student at uh, parochial school and for the, uh, some of those Jesuits that were a great example to me in high school. So. Well, that old statement, um, spiritual writer stated, in the ways of God, he who does not increase decreases, he does not go forward, moves backwards. You look through your constant journey, what would you kind of, you want to put a niche somewhere that kept you always moving in closely to Christ, what would you, was it the witness of, of your family? What would you say would be? Well, I think it was a mix between the sacraments, because I did uh, regularly attend the sacraments, and uh, both uh, the Eucharist and the Mass, and, and also confession. But I, I think the, the particular example of my like, prayer life and the rosary, and some of these little devotions that my mother exercised for years, uh, had, a, had a great, great effect on me. And also, Something that I always think of at times when I'm tempted to, uh, uh, and unfortunately I've come to too many times, but I always tempted to uh, uh, not do my prayer when I should, was remembering some of the old priests in their long cassocks walking back and forth in the old church, uh, reading their office, because apparently when I was a kid, uh, the, uh, uh, there was, uh, uh, the office was quite extended, and uh, they had to say it, I guess, at certain times, it was rather set. And I always remember that because I thought, boy, at the time as a kid, who wants to do that, you know? Uh, but that perseverance was, was uh, a major, major uh, influence on me. All right. A couple of questions to prime the pump for our calls. Yeah. Um, we live in a troubled age. Ages have always been troubled, right. but we certainly do. Uh, you can't watch the media without seeing it. It'll just mean the... the uh, the 9/11 crisis, or the, uh, the even the scandal in the church, but it just <laughs> I'm just amazed that every time I turn to newspapers and television, it just seems like the not just murders and violence, but within families and the broken families and everywhere. And uh, looking for places to put blame, what has led to this over the last 50, 100, 150 years? People look at different areas, and I know from my background as an evangelical Protestant. One of the areas that we would have looked at would have been modern psychology sure. and its impact on so many of our institutions, our culture, the media, the way we understand ourselves and the family. And here you are, a Christian psychologist, uh, come forth and defend myself. <laughs> Listen, I, I just had an appointment come up. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, yeah, the, um, uh, well, I think there's a couple of distinctions I think that are important to make. One is, is that psychology is, as a modern discipline, as a profession, is relatively new insofar as you deal with people with severe mental problems. And uh, it's been very successful, uh, allied with psychiatry, uh, helping people with severe psychological problems, uh, schizophrenia, depression, these kinds of things. Uh, and I'm, I'm very happy to uh, defend that aspect of, of psychology. And there are some parts of psychology, the research side of it, uh, that you see in some universities that is highly defensible and some very interesting work is done there on a practical level. Um, but the problem with psychology that's affected our culture in a negative way uh, is something that I, too, am concerned about and I'm not apologetic for as a psychologist. And it has to do more with the counseling psychology movements and perhaps the movement out of Freud in these folks. And uh, it's very problematic. And I think uh, I'm, an, as a, I think, a reasonably well-educated Catholic uh, in a position to understand those aspects that have a lot of benefit to offer, both in terms of being intellectually true, but also practical, uh, and uh, uh, also to be able to critique, uh, to criticize uh, where it needs to be criticized, because it's, it's, it seems to some branches of it seem to hold positions against our faith. Um, for example, the. The, the humanist psychology movement, I think, is very anti-Christian, and uh, I think it has been criticized by some great uh, Catholic thinkers, uh, uh, perhaps the most famous one in my lifetime is Paul Bitts, for example. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, by the way, the uh, audience will be a guest on the program, I think, in two or three weeks. He's a convert to the church, so stay That's tuned right. for That's a, right. a continuation of this discussion. That's right, and, and what's very interesting about his work, and, and of course he'll be the best proponent of it, exponent, but it had a great influence on me, is that he, he understood how uh, the modern humanist movement was designed, in a sense, to supplant religion or to replace it. Mm -hmm. That uh, these people recognize that there is a kind of spiritual impulse in people, and that... Uh, 
um, uh, psychology had a better way of going about it. And, and he shows, that, in fact, how they're wrong and, and the kind of debris that they've left behind them in this movement. And, and, and I make no apology for that. I, I think that there's some problems there. But that being said, there's, there's parts of psychology that are very positive and, and have helped a lot of people and, uh, you know, with severe psychological and emotional problems. And there's a lot of good psychologists out there, men and women who are very practically minded, morally minded, uh, and who, um, who understand uh, the Christian calling and who are sympathetic and, or, or uh, uh, actively promote the teachings of, of the church in, in, insofar as it's appropriate in, in a psychological setting, particularly in counseling settings. So, uh, well, there's a lot of that. It's, it's, it's a great example of that. Now, there's a lot of others, though. Out there. Well, when one goes with the, the idea that all truth is of God, right. uh, then it depends if you're seeking for true truth right. uh, and, and eternal truth, and how that informs your, uh, your work and your research is a key. Now, given this input on psychology, plus and, and minus in our culture, let's fine tune it a little bit. What about a relationship to the formation of conscience? Because you look at what's going on in our world today, and some will say, I'm doing this because of my conscience. Well, wait a second. It needs to be informed, but how has psychology uh, undercut that? The, uh, the humanist movement, well, uh, beginning with the Freudians, but the, the humanist movement in particular, I think, uh, uh, picked up this ball. And the ball that they picked up and ran with was this, is that ultimately the, the human person, man, is his own moral arbiter. And um, happiness can only be found when, when, uh, uh, when one um, kind of has to develop their own moral code. You know, uh, some of us may remember you know, the values clarification, but we clarify our quote unquote values, asking eighth graders to clarify their values. Uh, as if an eighth grader has the capacity to do that kind of Was thing. Was one where you had three parachutes and ten people? Yeah, and things like that. You had to decide yeah. which of the seven people sacrificed. That, that's right. And, you know, I know, I know the miners in Pennsylvania were thinking that when they all said, right, they're going to, which guy's going to go down here? They didn't say that, which is really interesting. I wonder if the value cl values clarification. Really the people are going to use it exactly right. Exactly right. All for one and one for all. And a great, great heroism on that part. And. And, and to heck with who's more valuable here. We're all human persons, we're all in this together. Um, but the, 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 uh, the humanist psychology movement had a false view of freedom because they thought that freedom, uh, which was a freedom from constraints, uh, would produce happiness. And what they didn't realize is that in, in, in the sphere of, of morality, what happens is that virtue produces freedom. You have to be virtuous in order to be truly free. Right? Because freedom is something that proceeds from, we say people are free when we say, not that they don't have fetters on them, but that they're capable of really acting from within their deepest interior part, right? Which is well ordered, right? So that they understand what is true and they know how to act based upon that truth towards some good object. And, and the humans didn't understand that. They thought that you, you, you arrive at truth only after you're given the freedom to explore this and to explore that. Whereas the, it, but even, even some of the... It's always experimental, then. It, it's always determined through... Through experiment, that's right, that's right. So, so you, get, you, get, um, you get these encounter groups where you, you toy with people's emotions and you get them to emote and, and then they supposedly discover things about themselves by this free expression of questioning and, and criticizing and reacting to the, uh, uh, the people around them. Um, but the, 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 the fundamental problem with the humanist movement was that they saw freedom as producing truth and freedom as producing happiness rather than seeing virtue as producing freedom mm -hmm. and that our happiness is in our freedom as the culmination of, of the development of virtue. Mm -hmm. And um, Christianity has always held to that notion that, that virtue has, and certainly Catholicism has held to that notion that, that virtue precedes happiness in some sense, that one's happiness is ultimately rooted in the perfection or the excellence of the human person in virtuous behavior. We also recognize in our culture that this uh, denial of the reality of the devil, the reality of evil, per se, and uh, that this has had a, a huge impact on a misformation of conscience. What was psychologists 
psychology's place in that? Well, the devil was the devil was in you in the sense that you you create your own devils, you dissolve your own devils. Uh, this is this is very consistent with the Freudian notion that if, if uh, you sit back and you have uh, an experienced analyst help you probe deep enough into your psyche, you will uncover the devils of sexual repression and these kinds of things. And uh, so the idea of a, of uh, uh, some spirit being out there having some influence on you or the people around you is is considered laughable. I mean, they, they, they were great scientists. They were going to take the great discoveries of physics and astronomy and these great scientific disciplines and, and mechanics and, and to to bring them down now and use these analytic tools to explain the human psyche. You know, there's no need for the devil anymore. I mean, there's no, there's no such thing as really evil. There's just pleasure and there's pain. There's something else that crossed my mind in the midst of this. Um, and from your experience as a psychologist and your training, per se, what I saw as a pastor too often in the way psychologists, psychologies were practiced mm -hmm. in relation to people is that there was this wise man, low man relationship between the counselor and the consulee. I know what's better for you. I know what you are even more than you know yourself. Right. It is almost like a plane of God. Well, there, in a sense, well, first of all, a couple of things. One is, is that there are different schools in psychology, and the, 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 uh, some schools may have been very doctrinaire in, in that regard. Uh, the humanists um, are clearly not that way, and, or at least not on the surface, yeah. they're not that way. The, the idea of, of, um, of uh, non-directive therapy and these kinds of things, where the patient discovers it on their own and that the therapist doesn't impose any of the therapist's presuppositions onto the patient. Mm -hmm supposedly doesn't impose these things. Um, the, uh, so there's a, there's a division within psychology in that regard. However, there's a sense in which it's true. I mean, if a person is, is fearful uh, and, and, or confused and they go to a counselor, they're assuming that the counselor either simply wants to hear them, you know, kind of emote and get, uh, uh, take the burden off their soul in some way, uh, the, the sorrows and whatnot can be lifted, kind of like crying, if you will. Uh, or, or they're, they've gone to seek advice, particularly people who are afraid. They're, they're, they're looking for advice. And so many of these people are very docile uh, and are willing to take suggestions, uh, at least up to a point. So uh, it would, I would say that you know, there might have been some condescension and these kinds of things, but it makes sense given certain circumstances. Right. You mentioned the word fear. I'm going to read a couple of scriptures and have you comment on this. In some ways, this is fine-tuning even our discussion on the relationship of psychology to concepts. Uh, two verses, or actually three verses, from the middle of Second Corinthians. Any thoughts on these? The first comes from chapter five of Second Corinthians, verse ten and eleven, and then I'll read uh, chapter seven, verse one. <clears throat> first, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive good or evil according to what he has done in the body. In the body, therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men. We are. But what we are is known to God, and I hope it is known also to your conscience. And to me, the operative phrase here, phrase here after we recognize that every single one of us will stand before the judgment seat of God, he says, therefore, knowing the fear of God. Now, I'll jump to chapter 7. Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit and make holiness perfect in the fear of God. Now, I chose these verses that emphasize the place of the fear of the Lord and the fear of God in our spiritual journey. From the New Testament, I could have gone to the Old Testament and chose hundreds of passages, but some think that the fear of God is an Old Testament thing. Right. And now since Jesus, it's all love God, love your neighbor, uh, as if the fear of the Lord wasn't a part of our spiritual development. And I would dare to say that many psychologies led to this uh, softening or maybe even the silencing of the teaching on the fear of God the last 50 years, your thoughts? Yeah, well, the, the, the psychologies, some of them served as tools to implement a philosophy that would have been very opposed to that notion. Uh, the, some of the so-called Enlightenment philosophies uh, and some of the great Enlightenment, Enlightenment philosophes, uh, the French philosophical movements in, in the 18th century, for example, in Rousseau, uh, the, this, this notion of fear of the Lord would have been very, very... Um, 
antithetical to their most basic beliefs. And, and those folks had a very uh, profound influence on the philosophical development of what later became movements in counseling and clinical psychology, particularly counseling psychology. So um, the, the psychologists, in a sense, served as the handmaid uh, to the enlightenment philosophers in the attacks on, the fear of, uh, attacks on these notions of the fear of the world. Would you, from your practice and the training, see that that's one of those missing threads and what's led to the problems we're facing today? Yeah, because the, the, uh, the, the fear of the Lord, as, as I understand it, is it from a, a kind of a, a philosophy of psychology perspective. The, the fear of the Lord is basically a, 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 an awareness of, a, of, of an objective moral order and that one is in some sense accountable to that moral order in, in, in the person of our Lord, uh, Jesus Christ, but, but God the Father, the Trinity, basically. We're accountable to the divine law, right? And that we have to uh, uh, govern our thoughts and our behaviors in reference to that divine law, right? So, um, uh, and, and psychology doesn't concern itself with moral fears. It considers itself with natural fears, and in some cases is very successful in dealing with some of those things. Uh, but it's singularly um, uh, poor, or an, oh, uh, I can say inept in dealing with the question of moral fear. Uh, and, and many psychological movements have gone out of their way to un completely undercut the notion of moral uh, fear, right? which is fear of the Lord. Yeah. All right. I think I've been seeing some emails pass before my eyes here on my monitor. Uh, yes, let's try this one first. This comes from Tony in Toronto. He says, great program. Thank you, Tony. So I think it was one of the American governors, Jesse Ventura, who said that people of faith are just very weak people who need something to hang on to so they become religious. If you are strong, just like a wrestler, you don't need this faith. Can your guest comment on that? Yeah, well, he plagiarized from Sigmund Freud. How <laughs> would <laughs> Yeah, Ventura is a plagiarist. I mean, yeah, what can I say? The, uh, um, yeah, there's, a, there's, the, there's an arrogance, um, which I, it's not peculiar to modern times. It's, you see this arrogance all throughout history. I mean, if you, if you read some of the, uh, the ancient Romans and the Greeks, there were, there were big fights between various Greeks and various Roman philosophers over whether or not uh, uh, you know, religion is, is the opiate of the people, etc. And of course, the modern version of that we find in Marx and, and people who follow his ilk and some of the existentialist philosophers. I was just going to throw in here that place, two places in Scripture that one says that the fool says in his heart there is no God. Yeah. That's in the Psalms. And in Romans, thinking themselves wise, right. they've become fools. So it goes way back. Yeah, it does. I mean, this is a, this is a very, very old point. And um, uh, casting, uh, uh, casting aspersions against religiously minded people, or atheists for that matter, I mean, th this is not the way to argue the position. And, you know, Ventura is, is a governor and a wrestler, a former wrestler, and uh, he thinks he's going to buy votes with this silliness. And, and uh, that's all I'm going to say. I mean, it's not a serious intellectual argument. Now, there, there are serious arguments about problems of evil, how can God be an omnipotent God and an all-loving God and allow evil away? I mean, these are serious intellectual discussions. Uh, but, so, uh, you know, why entertain Jesse Ventura? It's not theology. Yeah. I mean, well, that's a way of segueing into Sigmund Freud, I suppose. Yeah, I guess. I guess. Well, and given Ventura's personal life, I've heard stories of, and some of his crass remarks, I mean, he's very apt for Freudian psychology, as mine is consumed with uh, the netherworld, so to speak. Okay, we'll, uh, we'll leave it at that. Let's Let's take this next email. This comes from Stephen in Columbus, um, Nebraska. Uh, Marcus and Dr. Cross. And you talk about the faith and psychology. I can't help but think about scrupulosity. I have been plagued for years with this condition and would love any suggestions or resources you may know of that could help those of us who are scrupulous. Thank you, Stephen, for that. Well, there's, um, it's my understanding, and pastoral psychology is not... Um, uh, my area of expertise. Uh, so all I could really say there is that th th it's my understanding that within the realms of pastoral psychology uh, and, and more traditional understandings of it, there's, there's very um, clear ways of dealing with this problem, but that it's highly unique and individual to the person. So uh, you know, what I would do is I'd recommend finding a person uh, through a priest or a psychologist that uh, has the faith and uh, has some experience find, in dealing with these things. Define scrupulosity for those in, in the audience that oh, are not familiar with the term. Yeah, yeah. A scrupulosity is basically an excessive uh, or an obsession, right, with uh, the details of, 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 uh, of one's behavior that are always tinged with some guilt. I can't do things quite the right way, therefore I'm always susceptible to sin. 
Uh, and so the scrupulous person will tend to confuse fault, which is uh, a personal inadequacy, with an actual uh, moral vice or sinful behavior where one actively wills to break God's law. Right. So, I mean, we, we all have these personal inadequacies, and it, if we thought about it for just a few minutes, uh, it wouldn't be hard for anybody. Uh, uh, well, I don't know, maybe a, a certain teenagers from uh, 15 to 17 and a half uh, might, might not be able to find any personal problems. That's right. That's right. That's right. But I mean, most people uh, can, you know, can discover all these little faults in themselves. And, and what they do is the scrupulous person attaches some kind of moral culpability to that. Right. And so it doesn't distinguish between fault and sin, mm -hmm. right, on a practical. And it's, 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 a, it's a terrible cross that these people bear. It's, 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 uh, and it's something that I think has to be worked out uh, with a confessor or a person who's experienced in dealing with these problems. I remember reading one particular psych psychological writer that basically divided all people into one of two groups, either neurotics or character fault. And, and the way he defined it was, Whenever something goes wrong, the neurotic blames himself, and the person with the character fault blames somebody else. <laughs> and we're always, we're, all of us are somewhere along that continuum. Yeah. And my point is, is scrupulosity something that tends more to one certain kind of personality in that spectrum, or? Well, it, it's probably there's, yeah. It, it, um, I would say that if I had if I had to take a hip shot here, uh, it, it would be more towards the neurotic side uh, because it's compulsive, it's obsessive, you know, and, and there there is a there is a uh, a personality problem uh, diagnosable called obsessive compulsive disorder, and people really do have it, and it may or may not involve some kind of moral failing. And in this case, we're not pointing to our, our caller Stephen that that That's because right. is there a sense in which at certain times all of us right. can struggle with this, as you said, making a clear distinction between the sin right. and the guilt and uh, that's what we need the to guilt and the direction. Fault. Yeah, the guilt, the guilt and the fault. Yeah. Right. We all have faults, but whether or not we're, we, we should ascribe guilt to those faults is another issue altogether. And that's why we need spiritual direction and, and you know, thank God for all the spiritual right. guides in the church, the priests right. and religious uh, that we need so desperately. And we can pray for them because they have a very difficult task right. because of their calling. Let's take this next email, Marcia in Louisiana. Dear Marcus and Gas, a young friend at my church has a big problem. Her husband converted to Catholicism when they married eight years ago. Now, he says, because of the recent scandals, he has lost faith and Catholicism has gone back to his Baptist roots. He is vehemently anti-Catholic now and he will not allow his 17-year-old daughter to make her first communion or his son to be born, his son to be born, new baby, to be baptized Catholic. This has put his cradle Catholic wife in quite a bind. Does she follow her heart and insist that the children be Catholic, or does she do what her husband wants, leave the church altogether? Thank you for your help. Thank you, Marcia. It's a difficult uh, situation to answer here live, but thoughts? That's, that's tough. Um, first of all, to the husband, I think we all share the belief that though there are failed people in the church, and uh, the, we're all sinners in some sense, and some sins more grievously towards the common good than others, and that's the case, of course, with these, this catastrophe. Um, the, uh, our faith is in our Lord, and the priest and uh, other people who work in the church are all instruments of the Lord in some way, some more important instruments than others. So you don't leave, uh, and the, these instruments too, this is important, these instruments have their efficacy, not necessarily in terms of their moral perfection, but because of the grace God gave them when they were ordained. So um, uh, I hope that perhaps with prayer and sacrifice, maybe that in good counsel, her husband can be persuaded otherwise. Now, for her situation, um, the, the, the integrity of the family is, is a very, very uh, important good. And um, the, uh, uh, the idea that, of course, she, she has to maintain her, her faith and her integrity. But she should pray that her husband see the light. But to, to force these issues, how do you force the issue? I mean, the, first of all, I, 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 it's my understanding uh, that, that a priest would be very reluctant to baptize a child in this circumstance where you have now this, this tremendous fight. And uh, I think that this is one of these things where it's going to take great patience and perseverance. And certainly, again, this is one we encourage uh, local counseling with the priest and in his spiritual direction right. at the local level. And we will all. You've made it known to us who will all keep you in our prayers because it is a difficult situation. So let's take a break. We'll be back in just a moment with your questions for Dr. Richard Cross.
Welcome back to The Journey Home. My guest is Dr. Richard Cross. He's a doctor in psychology. He's now an educational researcher and consultant and uh, ta has taught psychology and uh, shared with us earlier his uh, lifelong commitment of faith. And uh, actually, this next email might touch a little bit on, uh, on your own journey. I mean, was there, a, there were blips and there were there was ups and downs in all of our journeys. This email from J.G. Hopper asks, uh, Marcus and Dr. Cross, how does the conversion, parenthesis, born again experience, fit into a life of faith for a Catholic? What role does it play? Can an individual have an additional conversion experience uh, as, as they grow in their faith? Thank you for your email. Yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting question um, because it touches on the whole issue of development and a continual development. And it also touches... I think directly on the question of fear of the Lord. Um, and as you've noted earlier, the, the, we haven't been talking in modern society, and even in the church, about the fear of the Lord. Um, and I think there's a way of tying in this notion of uh, kind of uh, continual conversion, or at least a new conversion with fear of the Lord. And it goes back to a great distinction that was made, um, certainly in the Middle Ages, if not earlier, probably goes back to uh, as early as Boethius, who was... Uh, uh, one of the uh, very early uh, church fathers. And the, uh, uh, the idea was this, is that in reference to moral fear, what we mean by moral fear is the idea that, that we see God uh, as embodying the transcendent moral order that we owe our allegiance to, and we must conform our thoughts and our behaviors to in some way. And that through this, this conformity or the embracing, rather, of, of, this, uh, of him and his goodness that... Um, um, we uh, become virtuous, we become holy, and ultimately we find our happiness in that. Now, um, the, 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 uh, the ancients divided this type of, of pursuit and, uh, into four categories of possible fear that was related to it. One would be a person who simply rejects the idea that God is, is, is the, the greatest good and subordinates God. Yes, there is a God, but really what's really important to me is my career, or this or that, but something that's certainly not spiritual. And that they called that worldly fear. Uh, that is to say, they feared, since they loved the world more than they did God, and they were quite aware of that, that displacement of God in his supreme character to some kind of subordinate role, um, that they, they feared the loss of the world, hence the name worldly fear. And, and the church doctors and fathers uh, saw that as, uh, as a very serious mistake, seriously sinful. But there were three other kinds of fears uh, the, uh, uh, which, which uh, um, they talked about, all of which led towards God, and some of which would probably surprise some of us. One of them they referred to was called servile fear. And the servile, of course, relating to the notion of uh, servant or uh, the more extreme form, slavish, which hardly sounds like a good thing. Um, and uh, what it is, is, they define it as fear of punishment. But what they, they characterize it as being a potential good uh, and leading one in a yeah. conversion experience was that sometimes in great moments of weakness, we, we fail to do bad things, right? We default to the good. <laughs> we default towards God for fear of his punishment. And the fact that his punishment is, is a righteous punishment. So we're in the state of charity, uh, and it, we, uh, we advance in some sense because we we fail to, uh, to, to fall further, right? Uh, uh, but it turns us in God's direction. It turns us in God's direction. That's yes. exactly right. And it's a fear of punishment. And he said, but that's, that's a rather uh, imperfect type of turning, right? But it is a turn. It's the beginning. Right, it's the beginning of the turn. The next level up is what they call filial fear. And this is something that is very common, even on the natural level, uh, where you see with children who, who are... Uh, seek to please their parents in some way and to get the approval of the parents for their behavior and also refrain from doing bad things, disobeying their parents, uh, for fear of, of, uh, of uh, attacking the relationship with the parents. Disappointing the parents. Yeah, exactly right. They have, they have affection towards the parent. Um, they, um, uh, they affiliate with the parent. They see the parent in some way as a very important part of their life, not just because they provide a house and a, a, a roof over the head and three square meals, so to speak, in a video game, 
but uh, because there's a real bonding there, right? But they further, and this, this is a key, they just don't see it as a bonded relationship. They see it as a moral relationship with the parent, right? And th this prevents a lot of misdeeds in people. Um, uh, another analogous term was filial fear, which chased fear, all right? Uh, the fear that, that, that the spouses have towards each other. And again, it's not fear of being hurt. It's rather it's a fear of hurting them through a mistake that I make as a spouse, right? Uh, referred to as chase fear. So these things can all, in a sense, give rise to a kind of reconversion. And particularly if there's a powerful event or series of events that, that give rise to the exercise of these fears. Now, the fourth, did you get them all? Oh, I'm sorry, the, the initial fear. And the, the reason why I left it aside is it's, it's, it's kind of somewhere between servile okay. and, uh, okay. and uh, filial fear. Okay. Um, where where we're, we, we are, yes, afraid of punishment, uh, uh, but we, we also have some affiliation or some affection for the person, or God in this case, in terms of the moral order. And, and, uh, and yet there's a mixture. It's kind of a okay. I remember St. Thomas. He, I looked up that specific section. I've not read all St. Thomas. Hopefully I'll do it someday. But that section, because I'm very interested in this topic, and I always I looked at it as, and I think this does refer directly to the question, it sounds like we're being philosophical and avoiding the issue of conversion, but I think it's directly, is that if you think of a, of a needle on a gauge, right. and the ultimate goal of our growth in holiness is that text in Second Corinthians, we grow in holiness in the fear of the Lord, right. is that one time we'll stand face to face and look God straight in the eye without embarrassment. That's our call to grow in holiness. Right. But everything is pulling us back in our direction. So it's that initial servile fear which gets the needle going. That's right. Okay, and then it's that, in, that what you call it, the initial fear, that it's kind of that point that goes from this direction that goes over towards the filial fear direction. That's you right. know, and the filial fear is that right. direction where we're really drawn to God, not just out of fear of punishment, but out of love That's right. for God. Right. And, 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 and a fear of disappointing Him. Right, and, and severing or at least damaging the relationship. That's exactly right. Uh, That's exactly right. And, and, and it, it's my understanding, too, that in the ancients thought that filial fear is the fear of the Lord. It is. It's you fear to damage that relationship. And maybe just a direct summary to that question, uh, conversion in the life of a Catholic should be happening continually. The danger, you know, we talk about presumption in Protestantism. You know, once saved, always say, well, there's a presumption in Catholicism, too. You know, I've been baptized, I go to Mass, and I've arrived. Uh, every Catholic must be a convert. Every Catholic must accept Christ for themselves. That's what confirmation is, confirming what the baptism did in their life. And it's a constant day-by-day -day growth, and the spiritual writers remind us of that. Google Grass talks about the three ways. Each of them is a conversion right. that happens. Well, I mean, and also, there's a, there's a kind of humility involved in it because this idea of continual conversion. And the reason why there's humility is because it, 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 it's uh, the person's awareness, the deep awareness that I can always fail. I can always let the Lord down. And so that means I always have to be pushing forward, you know, uh, and, and striving for perfection. I mean, there's even a metaphor, we just had the Tour de France here, right? And, and well, I, I don't know if it was Lance Armstrong, but one of these great cyclists says, it doesn't get easier, you just get faster. <laughs> They're always pushing the pain envelope, you know, and the, the idea that perfection isn't always pushing forward. And just to make sure that someone doesn't misunderstand, we're not teaching the Catholicism as a works thing. It's but for the grace of God go on. Oh, the sure. every That's single right. moment of our life right. is the grace. Well, you can't do it without responding. You can't do it without. It's, it, it's right. the mystery of that, that relationship between our freedom and God's grace. Right. Let's uh, take our first caller. Hello, Frank from Illinois. What's your question for us? Hi, Marcus. Hello. I enjoy the show. Uh, by the way, I'm a part-time student at a Jesuit university in Illinois, so I really uh, appreciate your show and EWTN in general. Great. I, I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Cross what he thinks about our accountability and relationship to people that suffer with uh, depression and, uh, and sin. I have uh, brought up the issue in uh, the confessional and I've gotten some confusion uh, feedback. Do you think that sin is responsible for most depression? Uh, I've, I've had limited uh, success quitting medication and trying to find healing in my faith. And I just wanted to know what Dr. Cross thought about that. Thank you, Frank, for your, for your question. Um, very nice question, Frank. Uh, you know, I don't know you very well. I don't know you at all, rather. And, and from the description of what you said, I, I would uh, hesitate to comment specifically towards you. But in general, I think it's 
I can I can make these these comments that uh, would be clinically as well as morally valid. Uh, there's uh, undoubtedly there are depressions that arise in people that are beyond their moral capacity to control, and that would be due to the fact that uh, there would be uh, problems in their uh, brain chemistry or these kinds of things that that uh, have nothing to do with their behavior or their will or their tendency to turn towards God. Uh, might have to do with their, their temperament or some kind of uh, physiological predisposition towards these things. That's the first point. The second point, though, is this, is that there are, I'm just as sure also from my own uh, clinical experience, uh, that there are people who become depressed in part because of moral considerations. And um, the, the, let me give you a real simple example. Um, you take a person who gets heavily involved in drugs or alcohol or sexual promiscuity, and uh, all of which in the beginning may have uh, no psychiatric component to them at all. It's just a bad decision they made. They gave into peer pressure or curiosity or some combination or what have you. Uh, and uh, it develops into a habit, and uh, uh, they, 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 they lose heart. They begin to despair uh, morally that they can't get themselves out of it. So they give up trying to get out of it, and they become as some of the ancients used to say, they become spiritually slothful. They just stop asking God for help, uh, mm -hmm. which is the kind of uh, despair, and uh, thinking that God, well, can't help them anyway. And, and because of that moral failing, uh, they even throw themselves more deeply into their problem. And, uh, of course, there are physical as well as psychological consequences to this behavior, and it sometimes leads to very severe depressions. Mm -hmm. um, but the, uh, the, that's one scenario. Right? But then there's the other one, too, with people that, for which there's no control. I mean, the clearest examples of these are with the, the people who suffer from things like schizophrenia. And there's every indication to believe that this is completely outside their control. Yeah. What about, um, I don't want to push this too far, cause, uh, but the relationship between depression and a uh, dark night of the soul. I mean, it's sometimes hard to tell between the two. Yeah. I and mean, that can be rough, right? If, yeah, I'm not the one to do it. <laughs> I think that that involves some uh, some very That's why we serious spiritual direction, yeah, and, and experienced spiritual directors, yeah. very experienced. There's a um, there's a story. Uh, I hate to repeat myself, but I think I said this two years ago. The story of Saint John of the Cross and went into a convent, and they brought him in. Um, I can repeat myself from two years ago, can I? Yeah, yeah, for sure. The, uh, <laughs> the um, uh, the this was when the Inquisition was in high gear in Spain. It wasn't a very happy time, I would think. And there was this particular nun who talked about having visions and whatnot, and, and she was apparently very odd and whatnot. And they, they, they called in St. John of the Cross to assess whether or not she was possessed by the devils. Because the assumption was, a uh, rather common assumption, though not as universal as some people might suggest, the assumption was as if you acted in a bizarre fashion uh, and you cloaked it in some kind of religious terminology that there was perhaps demonic influence. Well, that might have been true in some cases. But in this case, St. John of the Cross went and interviewed her and walked out a short time thereafter. About like, I think it might have been a couple hours. And they said, well, is she possessed? And he looked at his uh, interlocutors and said, no, she's not possessed. She's just cuckoo, you know? <laughs> and, uh, um, you know, so the, the, uh, uh, there's these distinctions that have been in the church for a long time. And um, it takes a really experienced person to, uh, to you know, sort these kinds of things out. All right, thank you. Let's look at our next caller, Terry from Michigan. What's your question for? Yes, uh, good evening, uh, Marcus and Hello. Dr. Kropp. Um, I've noticed that many of those who rightly condemned the events of 9-1-1, uh, recent child kidnappings and murder, and the shenanigans in corporate America, uh, many of these people still hold a moral relativist uh, philosophy, which is, uh, you know, schizophrenic. I'm wondering uh, what Dr. Cross thinks about this uh, morally bankrupt type of thinking. Uh, it's status amongst uh, his colleagues in the field of psychiatry and psychology on uh, college campuses and general public are wondering if this philosophy um, is still um, rampant. The moral relativism is still rampant. Oh, yeah. What he's pointing out though is, is interesting. Yeah. You've got this moral relativism, yet they're condemning these certain acts. Right. Yeah, and some people are moral relativists aren't even condemning the acts because everybody has their point of view, right? Everybody has their grief uh, or their beef. But the um, um, yeah, moral relativism is still alive and well on college campus. I don't teach anymore, but uh, uh, the, uh, I have friends who teach, and uh, it seems to be um, a gathering steam every day. Uh, and why wouldn't it? Why wouldn't it? What is it about the colleges that would 
turn these kinds of things around. I mean, short of some unbelievable catastrophe, um, which apparently uh, brought a lot of people to um, a more spiritual sense of things in, in and around New York, and I think a, a sincere turn of heart here in, this, in the United States after 9-11. Um, there's a pretty entrenched a moral relativism on college campuses, and I don't see it changing anytime soon, because there's nothing in the organizations themselves within the institutions or within their departments that would bring about the change. And it's, I don't know, is it amazing that it's one the day? I mean, that it, uh, it seems like whenever anything in our culture goes in any one direction, it doesn't move towards the more spiritual and more moral. It's always in the other direction. Well, it's, it's easier to backslide than it is to climb the mountain. It's, it's always easier to go down than it is to go up. In science, we call it uh, entropy. Entropy, that's right. There's a kind of moral entropy. Exactly right. Right. Let's take this next uh, uh, email from Patricia Burke in New Jersey, Marcus and Dr. Cross. Could your guest explain why, on the issue of abortion, the role of psychology seems to ignore the issue of women who suffer for years after an abortion? The critics always blame religion as the reason for guilt. Thank you, Patricia, for that email. Well, they're, thank you, Patricia. They're blaming the messenger. Uh, shoot the messenger. It's the most uh, common thing in human history, <laughs> right? Um, the uh, religion uh, doesn't c cause the guilt. What it does is it provides a circumstance. The teachings of the church provides a circumstance for people to take, take note of the true perspective of their actions. What about the ignoring of the, the, of the after effects for women? Yeah, well, th there's, there's still some debate as to what mental health components are involved, but there's no doubt that many of these, these women uh, walk around with guilt. Whether or not it's, 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 it leads to you know, depression or severe pathology is another issue. But the, uh, some people say yes, some people say no. I don't know where the data really come down with that. I'm not sure if this one falls under your expertise, but let's try this email. Mm -hmm. From uh, Mickey and Bill in Browns Mills, New Jersey, what are your thoughts regarding the Enneagram as a spiritual tool? My husband and I recently attended an Enneagram workshop and found it informative, but we do wish to pursue, but we do not <laughs> wish to pursue this model when it comes to deepening a relationship to God. What do you think? I don't know much about the Enneagrams. Um, uh, I would have some doubts about those kinds of things being able to give any kind of fundamental spiritual insight. I do know something about testing. I've been, I spend a lot of my time now professionally involved in consulting with uh, individuals and schools and whatnot about testing issues. And um, the psychological testing uh, is, is something that, uh, and, and the Enneagram is a kind of test. It's a way of assessing, right, uh, a certain state of mind. Actually, I don't know much about it either. I've kind of stayed away from it. But what it kind of reminds me of is these, um, uh, methods of grouping people mm -hmm. in their personality type. Right. The one I'm more familiar with was the old Meyer Briggs that was really right. big 10, 15, 20 years ago that right. I haven't heard much about. Right. But again, I remember reading books that said, well, if you're an INTJ, then you ought to pray this way. Right. Right. Well, what about the use of those kind of things in terms of the spiritual realm? Um, I would be skeptical, not because I would think that it couldn't be done, but it's very difficult to prove that these things work the way that people say that they work. Uh -huh. Validating tests are, is a very complicated business. And, um, you know, you can, if there's a big market for it and people sell a lot of product, doesn't make it true. Yeah. You know, um, uh, so that's all I can say about it, though. I, maybe it's valid, but I would be suspicious. It probably uh, touches on a, a deep psychological issue that actually feeds psychology in the sense that people are looking for answers but often they're looking in, in other directions than the obvious. In other words, rather than listen to the church that Christ established, I've got to be someplace else I can hear that's going to answer my problem within me. There's no question this happens all the time. And in fact, it's, it's happened very close to home recently, mm -hmm. where you turn to psychologists or lawyers for advice about things that are ultimately spiritual. You know, in, in terms of things like sexual behavior and stuff, the, 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 the church is the expert on pagan sexuality. It brought Western civilization out of pagan sexuality, and yet we don't seem to turn to the church doctors or fathers and study their stuff uh, carefully uh, to assess what's going on around us today, both within and outside the church. It's a real shame because there's a great wealth of wisdom here. Um, oh, I have to think you're going to have a strong thought on this next email. It comes from Leonard Wolf in Baltimore. Thank you, Leonard. Dear Marcus and guests, what role do television and the media have in keeping Christians from doing God's will? 
Um, two. <laughs> they have two roles, I, I think at least. One is, well, three maybe. They teach, and oftentimes what they teach is bad um, and immoral, uh, the, uh, or at least amoral. And uh, that is to suggest morals aren't really important. The second thing that they do, though, is they distract. They distract you. Uh, and um, the, which is, you should be paying attention to this, and yet you're paying attention to that. There's a guy who does a lot of his, who spends a lot of his professional time on the computer, and there's always that temptation to go to that website and say, hey, what about this? You know, what a juicy bit of news here? And it's, it's, a, it's a constant temptation, and technology in general, you know, the, you know media technology in general can encourage that, uh, and uh, television in particular, and particularly now with satellites and, and uh, all these kinds of things uh, up there floating around. We have 5,000 television stations. Uh, I mean, you just, you, it's just constantly uh, distracting. Um, so those are, uh, those are at least a couple of things that TV does. A bad message, but also it's just a bad distraction. I mean, even if all the programming were good, if everything was EWTN up in, this, up in the skies, I mean, you have to get about your daily life. Yeah, you've got to be discerning. You have to be but, discerning. But, you know, I was, go was going to just make one comment. I've not had a chance to say this on the program lately, but uh, an example of where, with all the bad that we hear about television, yet we know that all this media and everything is having a good place, to play in evangelization is that, and I work in the coming network that I'm involved with that helps Protestant clergy come back to the church. Well, if you look back 50, 100, well, first of all, there's always been conversions from Protestant, Protestantism to Catholicism. Right. They're documented all the time. But up until about 50 years ago or so, the majority of the conversions were from Anglicanism, Episcopalianism, or Lutheranism. Uh, but what we're seeing today is amazing. Uh, just this year, for example, in just our small little apostolate, we've received um, phone calls and emails and letters from over 70 uh, Protestant ministers interested in becoming Catholics. And uh, the point is that they're from all different kinds of denominations. Mm -hmm. Never in the history of the church have more people been able to hear the fullness of the faith okay. uh, through the internet, through television, right. through all kinds of media. So there's there is the good use of that. And Absolutely. Seventy may not seem like a lot. When you think about some of these guys that are converting to the church from certain Protestant denominations that I just wouldn't expect that they'd be interested at all in hearing about the church. Very fundamentalist, anti-Catholic groups. You can see that the beauty of the media used by the Spirit to break through walls that otherwise would not be able to. Well, it's interesting because the, 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 the media in some sense does both for good and, and for ill. Something that education is all, good education is always striven to do. Uh, and, and that is this, is it allows a person in some sense to kind of transcend their local circumstances. Yeah. And um, the, in, in, a, in, a, in a true, fine liberal arts or liberal education institution, um, and when you read the great thinkers, uh, of, of Western civilization, of the church, and of the great philosophies and whatnot, um, you, you get a perspective on reality you could never possibly get before. And, and it's clear that the media has the capacity to take a sliver of that perspective taking and provide it to a very large audience. Now, the disadvantage is this, is that it tends to um, alienate people from the valid aspects of their local society or culture that are really important for maintaining family life and local civic order. All right, got one minute, one final question. How has your faith and love for Jesus uh, informed your psychology? Wow. Um, it's taught me unequivocally, right, that the most important things in life are moral and have to be directed towards God, and that you can't avoid the, the God question in psychology, ultimately. Human happiness as St. Augustine says, our souls are restless until they rest in me. It's a fundamental question. Great. Rick, great to have you back. Thank, Thank you. for witness to and for your work. You know, we need good men in this field. It's an important field. Thank you very much for great to yourself life. to it. Thank you very much. Yeah. And thank you for joining us on the journey home. It's always a pleasure. Thank you for being a, a part of this open line Monday program, first Monday program, which uh, it helps us know what your interests are through your phone calls and emails. God bless. Keep your prayers for Mother Angelica and the sisters. And thank you for your support of this network. EWTN would not exist except for your generosity. Thank you. Thank God bless.